Hello, my name is Wenchen Ouyang, or Ouyang Wenjing in Mandarin Chinese. And I am a fellow of the British Academy, which is the UK's voice for the humanities and social sciences. In the 10 or so minutes I have today, I would like to introduce my new project on the ways in which material culture connects seemingly disparate literary traditions around the world in unexpected ways. Coffee is my example. Coffee is everywhere in our life today. For many of us, it marks the beginning of our day and signals respite from work in the middle of the day. It wakes up our brain cells in the morning and replenishes them with energy in the afternoon. It is all too familiar a mundane quotidian drink. So why would the professor of Arabic and comparative literature take it on as a subject of study. As a Chinese Arabist interested in Arabic Chinese comparative literature and more broadly South-South connections and exchanges, I have found the current theories and practices in the two areas of relevant literary studies, comparative literature and word literature, confining. Informed by definition of language, text and genre that are grounded in the concept of territorial nation-state, comparative literature privileges West, East, and North-South influence or parallel studies, while world literature tracks the movement of literary works through translation from Southern national fields to cosmopolitan Northern literary capitals. Direct literary contacts, often through Southern authors and translators, mastery of Northern languages are necessary. In such configurations of comparative literature and word literature, Arabic and Chinese literary exchanges would be deemed improbable. However, our experience of the quotidian says otherwise. Arabic and Chinese, in fact, all our languages, cultural practices and literary works are saturated with things, concepts and word views from around the world. Coffee as a drink, commodity and cultural practice links one thing with other things, the local with the global, social life with intercultural exchange, and politics with aesthetics. We catch a glimpse of this in the following passage from Mahmoud Darwish's record of one day in August in 1982 in the Palestinian life in Beirut. Memory for forgetfulness in Ibrahim Muhawi's beautiful translation. Beirut was under siege and the PLO was getting ready to move to Tunis. I want the aroma of coffee. I need five minutes. I want a five minute truce for the sake of coffee. I have no personal wish other than to make a cup of coffee. With this madness, I define my task and my aim. All my senses are on their mark, ready at the call to prepare my thirst in the direction of the one and only goal, coffee. Coffee for an addict like me is the key to the day, and coffee for one who knows it as I do means making it with your own hands and not having it come to you on a tray, because the bringer of the tray is also the bearer of talk, and the first coffee, the verging of silent morning, is spoiled by the first words, dawn, my dawn is antithetical to chatter. The aroma of coffee can absorb sounds and will go rancid even if these sounds are nothing more than a gentle good morning. Coffee is the morning silence, early and unhurried, the only silence in which you can be at peace with self and things, creative, standing alone with some water that you reach for in lazy solitude and pour into a small copper pot with a mysterious shine, yellow turning into brown, that you place over a low fire, oh, that it were a wood fire. Coffee, the key to the day, is to be made by hand in a copper pot and we can guess served in China. China here is not the country, but its famous porcelain, which is everywhere in our material world as well. Coffee for Darwish is to be consumed in silence and solitude in the morning, here but elsewhere in the same text with friends in coffee houses surrounded by chatter noise and exchange of news about Palestinians around the world. 
by the time we come to the end of memory for forgetfulness, we get a very strong sense that coffee is geography and that if we follow the aroma of coffee with our nose, we can visualize a transnational Palestinian community connected by coffee, coffee houses, and news of Palestinians exchanged around these. It is here the source of Mahmoud Darwish's poetics and of his reflections on solitude and sociability and on life and death. Those of us who have grown up in the Arab world and with Arabic television drama would not question the Arabness of coffee and its history in ancient Arabia. The contemporary Jordanian-Palestinian custom of serving coffee to guests at their arrival is traced to Bedouin customs in Arabia before Islam. Drinking the brew is an expression that the guests come in peace and refusal points to unhappiness with the relationship between two tribes and anticipates a contentious discussion of a dispute. As such, coffee is ingrained in Arab identity since, let us say, time immemorial. The history of coffee tells a different story. It shows such integration of coffee into Arab identity is a part of invention of tradition. Eric Hobson describes in his discussion of the pump and ceremony underpinning rituals performed by and around British monarchy. Coffee is native to either Yemen or Ethiopia and the Sudan. The first mention of coffee drinking among Yemeni Sufi circles appeared in the 15th century. Coffee reached Persia, Turkey, and North Africa by the 16th century, then spread to Europe in the 17th century and the rest of the world. The Dutch India Company brought it to Japan at the beginning of the 18th century. From there, it reached Taiwan and possibly the rest of East Asia and Southeast Asia. It spawned coffee houses around the world, Mecca before 1512, Damascus in 1530, Cairo thereabouts, Constantinople after 1555, Venice in 1629, Rome in 1645, Oxford 1650, London in 1652, Paris in 1657, and Japan in 1888. Coffee and coffee houses were not uncontroversial. They generated heated debates and were banned in Mecca between 1512 and 1524. Throughout the 16th century, attempts were made in Europe and the Ottoman world to ban coffee and coffee houses. Orhan Pamuk, the 2006 Nobel laureate, sums up the Islamic discourses on banning coffee and coffee houses in his 1988 novel, My Name is Red, like this, in the voice of a 16th century Ottoman religious scholar by the name of Husret Hoja. The drinking of coffee is an absolute sin. Our glorious prophet did not partake of coffee because he knew it dulled the intellect, caused ulcers, hernia, and sterility. He understood that coffee was nothing but the devil's ruse. Coffee houses are places where pleasure seekers and wealthy gadabouts sit knee to knee, involving themselves in all sorts of vulgar behavior. In fact, even before the dervish houses are closed, coffee houses ought to be banned. Do the poor have enough money to drink coffee? Men frequent these places, become besotted with coffee, and lose control of their mental faculties to the point that they actually listen to and believe what dogs and mongrels have to say. But those who curse me and our religion, it is they who are the true mongrels. Clearly, these attempts were not successful. Coffee drinking spread and coffee houses sprung up everywhere in the Middle East and Europe first, then the rest of the world with the help of European imperialism and colonialism. The coffee market is valued at 127 billion US dollars today and the British coffee house market at 10.1 billion in 2018 and 5.3 billion in 2023. Coffee became the dark gold of the 19th century economy of empires, European and Japanese, 
that drove colonial exploitation of the natural and human resources of the colonies already detailed as early as 1806 by Edouard Duves Decker, 1820-1887, also known as Multatuli in Max Havelar on the coffee auctions of the Dutch Trading Company. And coffee houses became the public sphere in which trade, economy, politics and international relations were discussed and debated in England. This English coffee house is the model of Kyrene coffee houses in the 1988 Nobel laureate Naguib Mahfouz's novels. An imagined modern democratic Egypt emerges in this fictionalized Kyrene coffee house where the various classes of Egyptians come together to exchange news and dialogue. Coffee engineered another colonial enterprise together with tea and other drinks and food is served as an impulse behind the ceramic and porcelain industry in Europe, which copied and competed with the Chinese blue and white sold around the world since the 13th century. The blue willow, modeled on the Chinese landscape pattern, is a design invented by English potters in the 18th century. It is today one of the most popular tableware around the world. You see it used in coffee houses, tea rooms, kitchens, dining rooms and restaurants, and displayed in museums, paintings, films, and television dramas. More importantly, we tell stories around it and on its service. The Blue Willow is an oriental tale inspired by Chinese stories of unrequited love. The two birds flying high in the poem invented to give Blue Willow an oriental flair are two lovers who die and transmogrify into birds when they are prevented from being together. This is how the poem reads. Two birds flying high, a Chinese vessel sailing by, a bridge with three men, sometimes four, a willow tree hanging o'er, a Chinese temple, there it stands, built upon the river sands, an apple tree with apples on, a crooked fence to end my song. As we have seen already, coffee features prominently in the works of Mahmoud Darwish, Naguib Mahfouz, and Horhan Pamuk. In word literature, it retains the original meanings associated with the Arabic word for coffee, qahwa. Qahwa meant wine, more particularly warmed wine, in pre-Islamic poetry. Wine is associated with desire and passion in pre-Islamic poetry and pre-modern Arabic writings. In The Thousand and One Nights, a feast of food, wine, and music is always a prelude to a night of passionate love. In Brazilian Lebanese Radwan Nasser's 1978 novel, A Cup of Rage, a cup of coffee left on the table to get cold is the barometer of the male and female protagonist's cooling passion that is the cause of their divorce. In Taiwanese Zhu Tianwen's 1994 novel, Notes of a Desolate Man, a cappuccino with cinnamon in the morning after a passionate wedding night assault the nose like a hurricane, and on another occasion. When the coffee arrived, Fido looked at me, waiting for orders, I just focus on the cup of iced coffee, overflowing with whipped cream and topped with the cherry. I was half meditating, half nodding, like a man appreciating a work of art. He took that as a sign that he could start drinking, and so, with total composure, he raised the cup to his lips, no longer feeling any need to pay attention to me. I was a lucky one for I was free to drink in his beauty and youth with my eyes. I was getting a lot for my money. In Haruki Murakami's 2002 novel, Kafuka on the Shore, coffee is the means to an audible sexual liaison between the teenage Kafka Tamura and the older Miss Sayaki. Mundane quotidian things often have a rich intercultural life. 
This is true not only of coffee, but also of other global commodities such as tea, cocoa, sugar, tobacco, silk, cotton, linen, porcelain, and spices, to name just a few. The intercultural life of a commodity informs its social and literary life in literary works as it travels across countries and domains it can be the source and site of creative innovations in aesthetics, ethics, and politics. Coffee, in its travels, brings with it a history of practice, a tradition of knowledge, and a poetics and metaphysics, depositing these in the host culture and weaving them into the fabric of cultural expressions so seamlessly that it is at home everywhere in the world. This intellectual life of things shows us how entangled our lives and destinies are. More important, it shows that cultural encounters can take place translingually and across literally text daily, and as such, it has the potential to pluralize comparative literature and word literature. Thank you very much for listening to my talk.